Welcome to your Vero camera tutorial. The goal of this tutorial is to provide an overview of a Vero camera and provide some general insight into optimizing each camera and the Vero system as a whole. By the end of this, you should feel comfortable mounting your cameras and have a general understanding of the different components of a Vero camera and the strategies used during the optimization process. The Vicon support team will still guide you through a specific optimization for your system, whether it be remote or on site. The topics of this video include first, how to mount your cameras. Next, we will discuss how capture rates can influence your camera setup. We'll then look at how to optimize and aim a Vero camera while providing helpful considerations that will help during this process. Vero cameras feature two unique mounting points on the top and bottom of the camera body, providing flexibility in how a camera can be positioned and oriented. Cameras should be rigidly mounted. This is usually achieved by clamping to a rail or mounting to a tripod. Regardless of the option used, there will be a tripod head used to secure the camera in place. When using a clamp, there is a bit of setup required before securing the tripod head. A stud will fit into the slot at the top of the clamp. First, loosen the screw on the side so that it is no longer protruding through the slot. When ready, press on the button on the side and slide the stud with the larger diameter screw exposed into the slot. Release the button and then tighten the screw on the side. It should look like this when you are finished. The tripod head will then screw into the stud directly. This is more straightforward on a tripod as the tripod head will screw directly onto the top provided that the screw and thread match. In terms of tripod heads, I will only present the options that Vicon currently has available. In the first tripod head, a standard pan and tilt, a plate is screwed into one of the mounting points on the camera body. The plate has arrows which help guide how it will be snapped back into the tripod head. The front will be inserted first before snapping the back of the plate in. This tripod head has limits in each tilt axis so the direction of the lens may not match with the arrows on the bottom of the plate. This can help to achieve maximum flexibility for camera orientation. The second option is a slightly more basic version of the traditional pan tilt head. The camera screws directly onto the head using the screw beneath the top plate. The knobs allow you to adjust the different tilt axes. The last option is the microball head. It has the smallest form factor and is quite a bit different than the previous two options. To mount a camera, loosen the unlock knob on the side. Then turn the top of the head into one of the mounting points on the camera. When it is tight, use the ball joint to properly orient the camera and then tighten the unlock knob to secure the camera in place. When physically mounting the cameras, it is worth noting three things. First, the default orientation of the camera view in the software aligns the top of the sensor window with the top of the camera when the Vicon printed on the side of the camera is right side up. If your camera is mounted at an angle and you want your view in the software to reflect this, you can go to View within the 2D camera view and select Rotated. Then using the left mouse button, hold and rotate to your desired orientation. Second. The aspect ratio of a Vero camera may help dictate its orientation. For example, a Vero 2.2 has an aspect ratio of almost 2 to 1, so in cases where you may want to increase the height of your capture volume, you may want to rotate your camera sideways. Lastly, the Vero cameras have a Vero focal lens. This provides flexibility for your camera position and the type of mounting solution that you can use within your capture volume. One of the first considerations you will want to make when setting up your equipment is your desired capture frequency. Viewer cameras, depending on the model, can capture up to a maximum frequency of 330 Hz. In both Nexus and Tracker, the default capture frequency is 100. To edit this setting, please open the software and go to the Resources pane, Systems tab, and select Local Vicon System. Within the Local Vicon System properties, the frequency can be adjusted under the requested frame rate box. Please note that not all frame rates are possible and that the closest viable frame rate will be automatically designated. For example, if I were to choose a frame rate of 101, the actual frame rate of the system would be 101.01 .01 Hz. 
The capture rate is critical for camera optimization as it affects shutter speed and thus the amount of reflected light reaching the sensor. Here are a couple scenarios to illustrate the importance of accounting for the capture rate. Here I have two well-focused markers with the capture rate set at 100Hz. When switching to 300Hz, you will see that the quality of the marker data was adversely affected due to the decreasing shutter duration. In the other camera, if I zoom in on the markers, I have opened the aperture to account for the decrease in light. When I go back to 100Hz, everything seems to look pretty good. However, as I zoom out, you can see that I have introduced a lot more noise onto the sensor. This trade-off between marker quality and noise will need to be addressed should you frequently change capture frequencies. To learn more about how to handle multiple capture rates, please see the video linked in the description. In general, the strategy would be to use multiple system files like I have done here and optimize the hardware for the highest frequency and use software settings to optimize at lower frequencies, particularly if you don't want to be constantly adjusting hardware settings. Before continuing on in this video, please make sure that you have your system connected properly. For reference, please see the video linked in the description discussing system topology which can guide you through this process. Please also ensure that you have your network card configured properly on your PC. A link to that video is also listed in the description. As mentioned, Vero cameras have a verifocal lens. As such, there are three dials that can be adjusted during its optimization. The dial closest to the body is the zoom. It ranges from its widest setting W, giving a focal length of 6mm, to its narrowest setting T, giving a focal length of 12mm. This gives a field of view of 98 degrees at its widest and 44 degrees at its narrowest. The middle dial is the aperture, which controls the amount of light allowed through the lens. O is for opened and C is for closed. The last dial is for the focus. This ranges from near N to far F. For those that have never focused an optical camera before, the influence of each dial on the 2D image can be difficult to understand. As such, I will use a Vicon reference video camera, the view, to help illustrate the effects of each dial on the 2D image. So here I have an image of the view camera within Nexus, as well as an image of the physical lens on the camera. This is with the lens at the widest setting. If I want to zoom in, I will loosen the set screw on the zoom dial. Before I loosen the screw, I will make sure that the screws for the other dials are tight. If the screws are too tight, I can use a 2mm hex screw. I will start moving the aperture dial from W towards T. As I do so, you can see that the image becomes unfocused. That is, I cannot actually see how much I have zoomed in until I refocus. So I will tighten the set screw on the zoom dial, and then loosen the screw on the focus. I will manipulate the dial until the image comes into focus. For a view camera, I would typically put an object out there to verify. That obviously won't work for an optical camera, but we'll talk about that when we switch to the Vero. So I will keep manipulating the zoom and focus in this order until I get my desired width for my field of view. This will include the two chairs. I can then tilt the camera to get the desired height for my field of view as well. Let's move on to the Vero camera now. Here I have my Vero view side by side with my view camera view. I've placed markers in my volume on the top and bottom of each chair, as well as two markers in front of the wand. For zooming and focusing my Vero, I will make sure to expose the grayscale data of this camera by changing the grayscale mode within the camera properties to all. Now when I zoom in on a marker, I get the pixel count in addition to the centroid of each marker blob. I will employ the same strategy I used when focusing the view camera earlier. That is to make the field of view narrower by adjusting the zoom. As I move the dial on the Vero, I will start to lose the markers because the camera becomes out of focus. By manipulating the focus, you can see that the markers will reappear again. When they do, you will want to zoom into the markers on your screen to make sure that they are actually in focus. We are looking for a tight circular image with a bright white middle and a gradient of grayscale towards the edges. I'll expand on this point a bit later in the video. Before I finish focusing, I will make sure to check the other markers in the field of view as well. To aim an optical camera, you can either lay markers in your desired volume and use them as a guide, or you can use a target volume. I will show this quickly here, but please see the video on the aim tool for more information. I will go to Windows, Options, 
and then enable the target volume. In the workspace view options for this camera, I will check the 3D overlay. Then within the systems tab in the tools pane, I can press start under aim cameras. I can then manipulate the position and orientation of the camera so that it encapsulates my desired target volume. I can also use this to set my zoom, but keep in mind as you zoom, you lose focus on the wand and as such, the target volume cannot be accurately placed in the camera view. You can see this happen when I place my hand in front of the camera. When you're satisfied with the image, click stop under aim cameras. So keep in mind that this can be a very iterative process. You may zoom in, then focus, then aim, and then realize you need to change the zoom again, refocus, and then go back and do the aim once more. Up until now, we've only focused on camera hardware settings. However, software settings can be used to further fine tune the performance of each individual camera and thus optimize the system as a whole. The two properties I will discuss are the strobe intensity and the threshold. The strobe intensity, as the name suggests, is the intensity of the light emitted from the Vero strobe units. While lowering the strobe intensity can help to control unwanted reflections, it will also affect the range of your camera as the distance that the light is emitted will decrease. I have two markers here at about 15 and 23 feet respectively. The top view shows a view of the entire sensor while the bottom view is zoomed in on the two markers while my grayscale mode is set to all so that I can view the pixels for each reflection. As I lower the strobe intensity, the noise in the volume decreases but the farther marker becomes less bright, resulting in fewer pixels. As such, the strobe intensity should remain untouched unless you have a small volume and experience issues with light reflecting off of your subjects or objects in your capture volume. I will set this back to default. The threshold is the minimum brightness in terms of its grayscale value that a pixel must be to be displayed within the camera view and be used as part of the centroid fitting of a marker, whether that be onboard the camera or using the software's algorithms. Using the same markers as before, increasing the threshold reduces the noise in the volume but gives the system a better shot at circle fitting the farther marker as there are more pixels present. We will take a further look into the effects of changing multiple settings on the quality of a marker blob now. When focusing a Vero camera, I want to make sure that the aperture is fairly open to ensure that the camera is actually in focus. Here I have an image which is fairly circular and fairly bright in the middle. I could be fooled into thinking this image is in focus. However, when I open the aperture, it is clear that the camera is definitely out of focus. I will lock in the aperture and then manipulate the focus until we get the tight circular image we saw earlier. The marker should look something like this. Keep in mind that this image will be different depending on the size of the marker you're using for focusing and the distance of the marker from the camera. Another consideration while focusing is to check the camera threshold. While the threshold can be useful for masking out noise in your volume, setting it too high can give the illusion that a camera is in focus since it has eliminated a lot of the duller pixels on the edge of the marker. Setting the threshold back to its default, we can see that this camera is actually out of focus. Once I have the camera in focus, I can consider making changes to the threshold setting. When going through this process, I need to check that I haven't opened the aperture too much. When I'm focusing a camera, I will usually be zoomed in on one or two markers. As such, I cannot tell what is actually going on with the rest of the image. In this example, when I zoom out from the markers, I can see that the aperture is so open that it is reflecting off a camera box that is situated in the volume. This is obviously not ideal as it will affect either the amount of data being collected or the ability of this camera to track markers. So I will close my aperture until that box more or less disappears from view. If there are still intermittent reflections present, this would be a good time to adjust the threshold setting. Another reason to check the aperture is that it may hinder a camera's ability to separate two markers that are close together. That is, a camera with a wide open aperture may blend multiple markers into one, as shown here. By closing the aperture, the grayscale at the edges decreases, thus allowing the software to accurately identify two unique markers. Just to give you an idea of what you can expect from the two extremes in field of view, I've got images from a Vero 2.2 camera that is zoomed all the way in at the top and zoomed all the way out at the bottom. The row of markers in each view are approximately 12 feet away and separated one foot from each other. The aperture in both instances was kept constant. 
The trade-off between the two extremes is that in the widest setting, you get less data for each marker in the form of pixels. As such, when choosing your field of view, please consider your marker size, capture volume size, and the distance of each camera from the capture volume. Also keep in mind that for other cameras in the Vero family, such as the Vero 1.3, you will have slightly different performance from that shown here. Thank you for watching this video. As always, if you have any questions about your hardware or software, please do not hesitate to contact us at support at Please see the other links for more information or more training materials as well.